everyone. Coasting with Maddie is coming to a close. It has been 10 weeks and we have virtually visited 31 ocean institutions, including ocean experts interviewed and our dives to the ocean bottom. We have learned about the largest port in the United States, the Los Angeles Port Complex, the importance of marine protected areas, the necessity of sustainable aqua farming, and the extent of resources at the bottom of the ocean, though only 5% of the planet's seafloor has been explored. We have interviewed experts in the ocean exploration and mapping, aqua farming, animal behavior, and ocean plastic pollution. We learned that the planet's water cycle is controlled by the ocean and how the ocean is being affected by climate change. To conclude Coasting with Maddie, we have the opportunity to hear from a local student growing up in Los Angeles who will soon complete her doctorate degree in climate change. Jacqueline Pittman studied environmental science and chemistry in college and is presently sailing on the research vessel named Sally Ride out of UCSD and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Most of these experts gave us advice about what high school classes and activities to participate in that would emphasize ocean science. Most important to note is that the scientists all took different paths and ultimately led them to their ocean careers. Sally Ride, the person, also grew up in Los Angeles and was the first female NASA astronaut in space. She traveled to space on the Challenger shuttle and made advances in physics at UCSD. The ship, Sally Ride, is the most technologically advanced oceanographic research vessel. quarantining before leaving on a climate change expedition abroad, Sally Ride, Jacqueline agreed to speak with us about her work studying the seafloor to better understand climate change. These are the other science crew members participating on this expedition. The expedition has since departed from the port of San Diego and headed north to their first collection site. Please look closely at the map. Last week, our speakers discussed at the canyons of La Jolla. This map shows the underwater mountains, valleys, and those canyons off the Southern California coast. The expedition will take the crew west to very deep water and return to San Diego. Now for Jacqueline Pittman's interview and her guided tour through a working science lab. Listen closely as she highlights topics we have covered over the last nine weeks. Hello everyone, we're really happy to have an opportunity to join you today. My name is Linda, I'm from the USCC grant program and the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies. And we're really excited to bring you Jacqueline Pittman today um, to share her research with you. She grew up nearby in Santa Clarita and went to San Diego for her undergraduate degree. She's now working on completing her PhD at USC in ocean chemistry. And we're really lucky that she was able to make time in her schedule because she's getting ready to leave on a research cruise. And she'll share a little bit about that. Um, and, and she'll share also how she used science and engineering, math and technology to create the device that she's going to be able to use to go sampling. So thank you so much, Jacqueline, for joining us today. And I'll let you take it away. Yes, thank you, Linda, and thank you to everyone at Grant who's helped make this possible. I'm really excited to, to be talking with you all today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully we can all see it. Um, so I want to talk to you about how um, the oceans are changing with climate change and how humans are a part of this. Um, I'll start off with the natural carbon cycle. And so carbon is all around us. It's one of the backbones of, of life. Um, it's what most of our bodies are made up of, all the food we eat, that's all carbon. Um, and it cycles through the earth in different phases. And so we have a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, cycling through all over the globe. And that um, interacts with the vegetation uh, through photosynthesis and respiration. So the plants breathe in carbon dioxide and to make their body mass and then they breathe out oxygen. And that's the oxygen that we breathe in as humans and animals also breathe in that oxygen. We breathe in the oxygen and then breathe out the carbon dioxide for the plants to breathe in. So there's all that cycle. Um, when the plants die, they take that carbon and become part that ends up in the rock record eventually. 
the ocean also has a lot of carbon. And so all the animals in the ocean is carbon and there's carbon in other forms too. Um, some of that carbon is in the surface water. A lot of that carbon sinks down into the deeper ocean and sinks down into the sediments at the bottom of the ocean. Um, fun fact, um, if you, you go to the beach and it's sandy, right? The sediments on the bottom of the seafloor are not sandy like that, they're muddy. And so a lot of times they're stinky too. Um, but it's this really muddy, sticky mud at the bottom there. Um, and it's because the deeper you go, the more the particles grind against each other and get smaller and smaller. Um, so there's lots of carbon in there. Uh, some carbon gets released from the inner earth through the volcanoes. Um, and so this is all the, the natural carbon cycle. But if you can see on the right, the fossil fuel emissions, that's part of the unnatural carbon cycle that humans are adding to. Um, and fossil fuels are a big part of anthropogenic climate change today. So what are fossil fuels? Um, they are really old substances. They were formed hundreds of million years ago, deep into the earth. Um, and they release a lot of energy when you burn them. And so we use these fossil fuels to power our society. Uh, we have three types of fossil fuels. We have coal um, and some, and a big example of that is it's used for electricity. Um, and the, the, um, we burn the coal to make electricity. Uh, a second fossil fuel is oil or petroleum. And so this is what we use to drive our cars, um, our gas cars. This is the gas that we put into it. Um, another thing we might not always think about with oil is oil is used to make plastics. Um, and so every time we use a plastic water bottle, it was made from oil that was formed hundreds of millions of years ago before the dinosaurs were even around. Um, and then our third fossil fuel is natural gas. And so this, um, a big use for this is cooking. So if you have a gas stove at home, if you turn it on and you can see the flame, that's natural gas burning. Um, otherwise, if you have an electric stove, that electricity might be powered from coal. So these are our three types of fossil fuels. Um, and to use all these products, we have to burn it. Um, and then the byproduct of burning these fossil fuels is carbon dioxide one of the one form of carbon um, this carbon dioxide it doesn't just stay wherever you burn it like in the kitchen or at the factory um, it goes over the entire earth because it goes into the atmosphere and the atmosphere cycles all the gases around the earth um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas a greenhouse gas you can think of it like a blanket around the earth um, and so when the, the sun shines onto the earth, it traps the heat, um, the greenhouse gases trap the heat closer to earth so that the energy doesn't just bounce by, back off and into space. Um, and so this, this is how greenhouse gases work and carbon dioxide is one example of a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases are not always bad. It's, they're natural and we do need some of it um, or else if we couldn't keep any of the heat in from the sun, our planet would be too cold for us to live on and we wouldn't be able to grow crops. Um, our water would be frozen. And so we do need some greenhouse gases. Um, but the problem is that we're adding too much carbon dioxide too fast into the atmosphere and the earth doesn't know how to handle it so fast. So what do fossil fuels have to do with the ocean? I told you I was here to talk about the ocean. Let's get to that. Here's my little factory on the left. Maybe there's a factory on the beach or the factory could be anywhere else because remember the carbon dioxide, once it's in the atmosphere, it cycles all over the globe. So it's burning fossil fuels and releasing carbon dioxide. The ocean actually helps us out in a way by absorbing about one third of the carbon dioxide that us humans have put into the atmosphere. And so that's good because um, in a sense, it looks like, oh, there's less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's good. But that carbon dioxide mixes with the water in the ocean to create carbonic acid. Um, acids are substances that they have an extra proton um, and to, to make it acidic. And you probably know of some acids just like in your fridge at home, um, like orange juice is acidic. Citrus fruits are acidic. Um, like Sour Patch Kids, like anything that tastes sour um, is acidic. Um, and so this carbonic acid, it's a weak acid. Um, there's weak and strong acids. 
strong acids can be dangerous. You probably don't have any of those in your kitchen. Um, but in lab, we have some of those and we have to be really careful with those. I have to wear goggles and the gloves and the black coat and everything because those can corrode your skin and be dangerous. Um, and there's weak acids like orange juice or carbonic acid in the ocean. And so it's a weak acid, but over time, if you add more and more of it, it can start to make a difference. And so this is what we call ocean acidification. And this impacts uh, marine life in the ocean, like phytoplankton or plankton or shells or any um, anything that makes a shell. If it's made of calcium carbonate, like these cartoon corals I have on the bottom, this carbonic acid will slowly eat away at the calcium carbonate shells. Um, and then they'll start to disintegrate and they, the, their shells form their homes. Sometimes they are the way for them to get food. And so if they can't eat and if they don't have any house to live in, basically, um, they won't be able to live. And so we, we're seeing some of these marine creatures are dying or having a harder time because of ocean acidification. So now I'm going to show you some data to, to, so that you know how we know that this is happening, ocean acidification. And so if you look on the bottom, the x-axis, the horizontal axis um, from 1958 to 2018, that is, um, that's your time scale. And so that's the years. Um, and then on the left y-axis, it says CO2 goes from 275 to 425. And then this first line is for carbon dioxide. And the legend tells us that the units are PPM. Excuse me, that starts for parts per million. That means that if you have 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide um, out, of, uh, out of 1 million air particles, 350 of those are gonna be carbon dioxide. That might not sound like a lot, but it does add up and these small changes make a difference. And so they started measuring carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere like this in 1958 in Hawaii. And so that's this little red triangle in the map. Um, they wanted to go far away from the mainland and where a lot of factories are so that they're not just getting a high signal from factories or something, but they're really seeing the global signal because the carbon dioxide is mixing over the whole earth. Um, and they see a very steady increase as we go further into time carbon dioxide's increasing. Um, if you're curious about why there's all the little wiggles, um, that has to do with the plants. And so in spring, when the plants um, grow, they start to breathe in more carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide will drop down a little bit. And then in fall, when the plants die, they'll release some of that carbon dioxide. And so that's why it goes up and down like that every year. Um, but overall, it's going up. And then the next plot I'm gonna show is, um, this is also CO2, carbon dioxide, but this is in the water now. And so we're still on the left axis. Um, the legend tells us our units are in micro atmospheres. Um, it's it's, it's about the same thing as the parts per million, just this is a measurement for the water. Um, and this is taken at Station Aloha, that red dot in the map. Um, and so you can see it's it's going up the carbon dioxide in the water is going up just like the carbon dioxide is the air in the air is. And this is how I told you um, about one third of the carbon dioxide that we emit is getting absorbed into the ocean. So we can see that with this green line. And then the last one is this blue line down here. And so now we're gonna use the right axis pH. Uh, pH is a measurement of how acidic something is. Um, it stands for proportion of hydrogen ions. Um, and so this blue line is pH and um, the lower down in pH you go, the more acidic something is. And so it's getting more acidic as we're increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere. And so this is really what ocean acidification is. And so this is data um, that you can see, you can actually go on this website and play around with it. I think we're gonna send a link out afterwards so you can do that, but it, they've got some interactive plots and a fun animation. Um, and then this is a set of pictures that really shows ocean acidification. So this is a healthy coral reef on the left. And you can see there's lots of little algae on the corals down underwater. And then this is what can happen with ocean acidification. Um, the coral, the algae on the corals die, and then the, 
the skeletons of the corals are left over and that's what that white part is. Um, this also happens as the ocean is getting warmer. Um, so I know this is all very sad and dire, but I don't wanna leave you with that. I wanna leave you with some things that you can do. And so it's not just up to the scientists to solve the problems or the politicians to make the rules to solve the problems. There's stuff that we can do every day, just at home ourselves. Um, you've probably heard reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, I told you that it takes fossil fuels to make the plastics. And so if you, um, reduce the amount of plastics that you use, especially like single use plastics that you just use one time and then throw away, that reduces the amount of oil that we have to use, which um, lets out CO2. Um, recycling puts that plastic back into the system and so they don't have to make new plastics. They can recycle the ones that um, are already used. Stuff like getting a reusable water bottle so you don't have to use a new plastic one every day. I got mine right here. Um, they're great. Um, reusable shopping bags. So if maybe you can help remind your parents when they go grocery shopping to use a reusable shopping bag instead of getting new plastic ones every time or new paper ones. Um, saving energy is a big one. And so a lot of our electricity comes from coal. Um, and so if we just turn off the light switch when we leave the room or we unplug our devices when we're not using them, that saves electricity, which um, saves fossil fuels and, and emits and it doesn't emit as much carbon dioxide. Um, also transportation, if you have the opportunity to walk or bike somewhere, that's great and it's more exercise too. Um, also even public transportation, <coughs> excuse me, even public transportation is great because a lot of people on one bus is better than a lot of individuals driving their own cars. Um, I used to take the train to school before before COVID and I would bike to the train station and then take the train to school. And that was great. Um, so there's a lot of different things we can do. I, I like the saying, um, not one person can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so there's a lot of little things we can do that really make a difference. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this right now and just talk to you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the um, the path that I've been on to get to here and the education I've done. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat's a little dry. Um, so I was born in Ventura, um, just a little bit north of here. Um, and then when I was 12, my family moved to Santa Clarita and I went to junior high and high school there. I, had, I knew that I wanted to go to college, but I did not know what I wanted to go to college for and what I wanted to do. Um, it wasn't until my junior year of high school and I took an environmental science class. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I think maybe this is something I can do. Um, and so when I was applying to college, I, I found a college that had that major, San Diego State. Um, and I studied environmental science and how humans are changing the earth and what the natural state of the earth is um, and how the earth is responding. And so that was really great. And then um, into oceanography, I, I did a summer research project um, where I did chemical oceanography and that was really fun. And I've always loved the ocean and um, going to the beach and swimming in the waves and stuff. And so uh, I wanted to learn more about it and just see the science that's really driving the ocean and ocean changes. And so that's how, uh, and I applied to graduate school because that's um, a good way to do research. And so that's where I am now. Um, especially for those of you in eighth grade, if you're gonna be going into high school and if your high school has um, optional science classes, like for, for my high school in our junior and senior year, we could choose out of a few different science classes that we wanted to take. That would be a great time for you to explore something new or, oh, I may be interested in this. Like I'd like to take this class and see if I like it more. Um, that's how I decided what I wanted to major in and then what I wanted to do for a career afterwards. Um, so that's kind of how I got here. Um, like Linda said, we have a research cruise coming up in our, our group. We leave um, next Monday. We start a quarantine for COVID and then we, um, the no, November 30th in the fall week during the cruise. Um, so I want to show you around my lab really fast. Um, Let's go over there.
Okay, so this is the lab. It's really messy right now because we are packing for a cruise, like I said. Um, but I wanted to show you some of the devices that we've been using. And so this is a mass spectrometer. Um, this can, it measures the, the, the mass of atoms. And so we can see how, how much concentrations of gases or different things are in a sample. Um, this is what our samples look like. Um, they're in little vials, and this is some seawater in here, and then we can measure how much carbon dioxide is in there. Um, and then we can look at the graph up there to see how much it is. And then actually over here, um, this is another mass spectrometer. It's the same system, but I can pull this one apart really quick. So this is the little tube that it sucks the air in from. It's measuring carbon dioxide. And I told you that we breathe out carbon dioxide. So if I start talking in front of this tube, we should be able to see it on the computer screen. Soon. This is what the computer screen looks like. I hope you can see this okay. Um, it's a straight line right now, but it should be going up. Oh yeah, here we go. So you can see it, this gray line right here, um, that's the carbon dioxide from my breath. And so I was just breathing on it um, and this machine is measuring how much carbon dioxide I just blew out. And so now it's starting to go back down a little bit. So, so these are the kind of things we can measure in here. Um, what else? Oh, this is called a fume hood. And so uh, if we're ever working with dangerous chemicals, especially things that give off uh, dangerous gases and we don't want to breathe them in, we work in here. And so you can see we always keep a little paper towel in here. And so the air is being sucked in here. And then it goes through a special filter to filter out any bad stuff before it gets to the environment. Um, this is an old mud bucket I used to be also talking more about mud buckets in a little bit um, that I used to test for my device and I got some ocean mud and it's all evaporated now and so that's how the white stuff is a bunch of salt from seawater that evaporated and the salt was left over um, but that's something that I used to test my device and my device that I'm going to be talking about more is this thing. And so this goes down into the ocean. We send it down to the bottom of the seafloor. Um, and this sticks into the mud at the bottom of the ocean. And this little filter right here, we suck through this filter to get out the pore water. Um, and so pore water is the water inside the mud. And it's really interesting because it can tell us a lot about the chemistry of both the mud and the water that's flowing through it. And so we use a syringe like this to suck the water through here. Um, and then we can measure the pore water for things like carbon dioxide and pH to see how acidic it is. Um, over here, we have, this is our alkalinity titrator. Um, and so this, we, we put samples, we put water samples in here to see how alkaline it is. And alkaline means that um, it's the ability for water to resist changes in acidity. And so it's almost a measure of how basic something is. So like the opposite of acidic. Um, but this is a rocks in lab actually. Um, and so they're soft rocks, they're like calcium carbonate. And so that's what corals are made out of. Um, but this is what that looks like. So you can see it. Yeah, so this is, we call it, it's a U2 because it's shaped like a U. Um, and then we put two different solutions on each side and then they come together in the middle. And if you can see this white part, that's actually calcium carbonate crystals growing. And so that's what corals and the shells at the beach are made out of. And so we're growing it in the lab so we can test it um, to see how fast it dissolves. Um, 
oh, this is our good old hazardous waste. Um, we use mercury in here sometimes, and mercury's not good for the environment, and so we can't just dump that down the drain. Um, if we have something dangerous like that, we have to put it in a special container and uh, send it to the hazardous materials facility, and they will filter it and treat it properly so that we're not putting those kinds of things into the environment. Um, oh, this is some more safety stuff. Always good to have that. Um, if you've taken a, a lab class, I'm sure you've had something like this. We have an eye wash station in case you were to get a chemical in your eye. Also a safety shower that I'm not going to demonstrate here because it would be very wet. Um, but if you get chemicals on yourself, it's, you always need to have one of these in the lab. Um, here's another thing that we use. This is another type of mass spectrometer. And this measures the gases in seawater samples. And so it can measure how much oxygen is in seawater samples, um, also nitrogen and a few other things. And over here is where we keep all our tools. And so this part's especially messy. Um, but we build a lot of stuff in our lab. And so we, we need lots of tools to put things together and break things apart, that kind of thing. OK, so that's the main lab. And then I'm going to show you guys the cold room. It's called the cold room for obvious reasons. Um, it's just like a big metal refrigerator that you can go in, basically. Um, and we have to keep things cold in here because uh, when we take things out of the ocean, it's usually a lot colder than normal air temperature. Um, and so we put it in the cold room so that thing, we try and keep things the most similar that they were in their natural conditions. And so these are actually some sediment cores that we took just uh, last month. We went out and took these. And so this is a little, they're just tubes of mud. This goes down to the seafloor and gets the mud and then brings it back up. Press to test. This is another one of those filter sticks. And it's got a syringe on the end of it. And so we just stick it into the mud and we can pull on the syringe to get out the pool water. So a lot of what I'm doing is about pool water, the water inside the mud. Um, sometimes we also cut pores in half, and so that's what all these half cylinders are. Um, if we want to see what they look like visually, and sometimes you can even see like lines for how much the sediment has accumulated. So this is a culture. I don't like working in here because it's too cold, but sometimes I have to. Okay, um, so that was the lab. Go back in here. Um, oh, this is a shirt. I, I just made these shirts for the cruises next month and they just came last night. And so I was really excited to wear one for this. Um, let me bring back my slides. And so I can show you guys about the cruise. Um, so this is, I'm sorry, I showed you guys the sediment cores that we just had. This is kind of how that works. And so we send this thing down to the bottom of the ocean. It's attached to the ship by a really, really long cable. Um, it goes down and then an empty tube sticks into the mud, gets pulled up on the top and bottom and it comes back up. And then once it's on the boat, we either can sample from it there or we take it back to the lab and in a cold room and we can filter out pore waters on the top. Um, but there's some problems with that um, because of the temperature and pressure changes. And so that's why we've built this, um, what I call CAD sippers. That's what I'm wearing on my shirt. Um, it stands for carbonate dissolution and sampling in situ pore water. And so this looks similar. It's on the same frame. It goes down to the seafloor. Um, and those little filter sticks stick into the mud and then the syringes draw the water through the mud. And then we just have pure pore water samples that we can measure for pH and carbon dioxide and that kind of thing. Here's a few pictures. Um, so science is not glamorous a lot of times. Um, this is when I was collecting mud, like I showed you in the mud bucket um, to test my device in, in the lab. 
it, it's really messy. Um, we just got had a bucket and a rope and we threw it over the side of the dock and dragged it along the bottom to get some mud. And then we had to sieve it and get all the shells and everything out. Um, and then even when I bring it back to the lab, it's still, still messy, um, but it's fun. And this is what one of my mud buckets looked like. Um, it is actually the bottom half of a recycling container because that's what I had. Like I said, science is not always glamorous. Sometimes you just got to use what you can find. Um, and then I tested my device in there. Um, this is what it looks like in real life. Um, and so I have the filters stuck on there. And so this thing goes down to the seafloor. Um, and filters out the pour water. There's also that black cylinder in the middle that holds a little mini computer um, and we have to keep it dry. And so we send it down in there and that computer tells, okay, syringes, you pull this water, syringes, you pull this water. And so that's how we do things while it's at the bottom of the sea. Um, as far as our next cruise, this is where we're gonna be going. So Los Angeles is um, uh, where it says San Pedro. We're a little bit north of that. Um, and then we're going down to San Diego, which is the red X in the bottom right. And then we're going to three different stations, we call them. So 450 meters, that's about 1500 feet. Um, so that's our shallow station and then a medium mid station and our deep station. This 4,500 meters is almost three miles deep. So we're going really deep to send it all the way down um, and collect our pour water. And hopefully we'll get lots of samples. Um, that's all I had. I, I really appreciate you being here. Um, Thank you so much. If you want to see how the cruise goes and what we end up doing, um, I just made a Twitter account. It's I just made it last night, so it's really new. But I'll be I'll be tweeting some more and putting up pictures. Um, if you want to follow along with that, it's Jacqueline E. Pittman. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really excited. I hope I don't know maybe we could talk or I could come visit or something at some point in the future when we're allowed to do that. Um, but I, I'm really happy to be able to give this talk to you all. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining me for this last episode of Coasting with Maddie. I hope that you all learned a ton throughout all of the nine episodes, including this one, so the 10th. But I really did not know much about marine biology before starting this. And I learned so much. So I hope that the same happened to you. And I hope all of this really inspired you to get into marine biology and learn a lot more. I'm also currently a student. I am studying film and communications. So it was really great to get the, boast, the best of both worlds with this. And yeah, I hope, I hope that all of you find a lot of success in your academic careers. And thank you so much again for giving me this opportunity. Bye.